Ah, well, okay. Uh, I don't know, probably we should, we should be starting now, or somebody from the organizers will just give me a go. Okay? Okay, I've got to go, so, uh, so we can go and start. Uh, I hope I'll be talking fast so we don't ruin the schedule more than, uh, than is necessary. Okay, so let me introduce myself first. I'm Maciek Pruchniak, I came from Warsaw, uh, from Poland. It's my first time in Madrid, I'm quite happy about it. And I work uh, for almost 10 years at not so small software house called Talk. Uh, we're working for different, different platforms from content delivery networks through various enterprise grade systems to installing some Hadoop clusters, doing stream processing and so on. But my, our main focus is on integration in, in large enterprises. And one of our largest customers are based in the telecommunication sector. We're working for, I would say, half of the largest uh, Polish mobile operators. So they are not as big as Telefonica, as I've heard many times, uh, at this conference, because they are based mostly in Poland, but still they have quite uh, a lot interesting data to process, right? So let's let us remind us uh, what are the data that the mobile operators are processing in kind of real-time streaming way, because this is what we are going to talk about. So the first of them, necessarily, uh, are various events connected to you making false sen calls, sending SMSs, and so on, like content delivery records. And then various billing events. Will they charge you for that call or not? And also, because everybody now is online, various data on network usage. Did you go to Booking.com or Google stuff or, or whatever? And also a lot of, lot of localization data from a mobile phone, either from GPS or for kind of more network connected uh, stuff, how, how close you are to a bait transmitter station and so on. So as I've said, uh, our customers are not as large as Vodafone or tele tele Telefonica, but still they have quite a large of amounts of data in, in terms of calls. In Poland it's like 3 to 5,000 per sec and peaks. And when it comes to network usage and localization, then the situation is a little bit kind of complicated because you can measure uh, localization data in various ways. Either it's active or passive and so on. And if you track, uh, track uh, your, loca your customer's localization in big with biggest granularity, you can easily end up with like, like 100,000 events per sec. So what we are using this data for? Well, I'm going to talk about two main use cases. One is fraud detection. There are many, many interesting ways that fraudsters tend to, to use telcos for. One is frauds on premise, premium usages, another is spamming people with SMSs, and also some more elaborate stuff like, for example, cloning SIM cards or SIM box termination fraud. I won't go into the details because I don't, un even frankly speaking, I don't understand how all the, of those frauds works. But still, we want to detect them very quickly. We want to compute, for example, aggregates, how many SMSs to unique, uh, unique our numbers you've set uh, in, in last hour. If it's like 3,000, then probably something is going on. And also, where have you been during your last location and last but one location? Because in like, if you like in five seconds you've moved from, I don't know, to Madrid to Bilbao, then probably, again, you're up to something. It's just not possible. And then, if you detect that you are probably fraudster, we want to probably to block your account as fast as possible, maybe send you an alert beforehand so, so you can react. But the most important thing is that we want to react very quickly. And another important mm, kind of area or use case is, is marketing, right? We want to find an interesting event. For example, you're running low on your balance or you are approaching our point of sales and we want to offer you a brand new Mac with a coffee. We have to check that you are the customer that we want to interact with. For example, you're not some kind of low income prepaid customer, but real postpaid one that we want to offer something nice. And again, we have to react very quick, quickly in, run time, uh, in real time, because if you just move past our point of sales, then probably it's no use sending this SMS like in a few hours. Okay? So on this conference, you hear a lot about artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms, and so on. 
But for many cases, at least at our customers, for them, it's kind of enough in the first place uh, to be able to filter the events, to enrich them in context, probably also score them with, with, some, with some machine learning models. But first thing is to filter out the interesting events and to enrich them with some kind of context of, of, of the customer. And with fraud detection, of course, it's also very important to be able to compute in real time some kind of windows aggregates, how much bandwidth are you using, how many calls are you, are you making. And the interesting thing is that mobile operators did similar stuff for many, many years in their core billing systems, right? If you run out of balance on your prepaid account, you're blocked in the real time, right? So why do we need any kind of more mm, advanced or modern system for that? The, the thing is that billing system is a core system and it's kind of very hard to change. People are afraid to touch it because it's, it's at the core of the company. So nobody's allowed just like that to, to touch the billing system as, and to change the rules, for example, when to block accounts and so on. On the other hand, they have many, many analytical tools, right? Warehouses, data lakes, you name it, right? And it's quite easy to get some data from that. You write SQL, probably, probably you can use some more elaborate vi visualization tools and so on. And they are easy to use. But on the other hand, the data flows to, to, to those places, not in real time, and they tend to have kind of low SLAs. So they, they are not necessarily fit for kind of, I would say, production use. Pr by production, I mean sending real SMSs, blocking real client accounts. So the thing that we want to do is to be as fast as the billing system, to, to be in real time and have really good SLAs. But on the other hand, we want the users to be able to interact with it as easily as, as they do with any kind of analytical systems, right? So, so, so this is kind of a challenge. And how do we approach it? Well, and most of deployments of, of similar systems, we end up with kind of architecture more or less like that. So in the center, there's this stream processing engine. In our case, it's Apache Flink. And then the data flows from kind of source systems through usually Apache Kafka. And again, on the right, we, we perform some actions either directly or we send it to, to, to some kind of output topics. And probably you have some fast, real-time mm, client profile to, to enrich <coughs> to enrich events with, uh, with some kind of more static data. And at the above, we have something that's our own that I'm going to talk about, right? So this is kind of not so special. Probably many of you have seen such architecture. But the two core, uh, I would say, components are, on one hand, it's Apache Kafka as standard method broker, and Apache Flink as our powerful stream processing engine, right? Apache Flink is probably a little bit less well-known than, for example, Spark Streaming, but nevertheless, you should really check it out if you haven't heard or used it. Uh, at this conference, there's Alyosha Kretek, who is one of the creators, so he's a great person to, uh, to ask about it. He's sitting right here, I think. <laughs> so why we've chosen Flink? Because at the point when we started, there was really almost no, no real competition. And we want to have very low latency, like in, I don't know, in milliseconds or tens of milliseconds. It had really impressive window API that allowed you to, mm, to define very complex state processing. It also could give, and of course, uh, currently also can give guarantees on that, that the data processed from Kafka and sent to Kafka will be processed uh, exactly once, no matter if, if, if the job that you, are, uh, you created failed or not, or you redeployed it. And also, you can handle pretty, pretty large states in real time. This is especially important for, for example, um, fraud detection, because, for example, you have to keep running aggregates of, for example, all, uh, all the unique numbers that people are calling in, in the last few hours. So this state can get easily out of control. That can be, wow, people sometimes even reach terabytes. We, we, we rather reach like tens of gigabytes, but still it's quite, quite, quite large. So Flink is great, but as you look as, at 
all those points, you can see that they are mainly about operational excellence and the APIs for the developers to, to work with, right? I don't know if this appeals to, for example, your business users or stakeholders. Of course, if you, if you tell them what that means, then it's okay. But how do you actually use, let, let, let user design their fraud detection rules and so on? So now we'll talk a bit about how to create Flink jobs. Because like Spark or, or similar frameworks, Flink comes with really nice Scala DSL and lets you write a kind of concise and self-explaining uh, self-explaining definitions of jobs. But of course it's self-explaining by de for developers and for poor business analysts who are used to, I don't know, in our case, many times to Excel and SQL, probably not so much. Probably they won't necessarily understand what is this underscore be before customer and so on. And the situation is even harder in our case because we are not part of the of the mobile operator. We are independent software vendor, and at, at our customers, they have their own silos, right? They have business people, analysts, IT teams, and heaven forbid, ops, and there are boundaries between each of these kind of departments, but you can tear all those boundaries, but you cannot tear this one. We are a separate entity, and it's always better for our customers to design rules themselves than go to us <laughs> prepare a change request, put it into Jira, and wait when we have time, right? So we want to let users, or at least analysts, define the business rules. And this is kind of our history. Uh, like, more than two and a half years ago, we started a proof of concept of such solution with Flink. We achieved, of course, great results. But then, of course, all the processes were hand-coded, right? Uh, Hard-coded. And then our client approached us and said, OK, and if you want to, to write new processes, what would we do or change it? Well, you will have configurations and you can change it. But configurations is not enough for us, right? For example, we have to add new rules, add new conditions, and so on. So we said, OK. So we'll let you configure a little bit more. You will write this color expression stuff. And we'll just integrate it. We'll compile it, integrate it. You'll learn it fast. Scala is, easy, is an easy language. So I said, hmm, yeah, really? Maybe we could do it. But they still didn't look too convinced. And we were also not convinced that they will be able to, to, to write Scala code. So we thought, OK, we'll prepare you a graphical user interface where you can just drag, drop, and see and on some kind of diagram what you're doing. And I said, OK. And this is how we created our open source project called Nusknacker. I know the name is kind of strange, but it comes from the fact that Flink is from Germany, and it has square in its logo. And for some stuff, you probably need some more, something more than Square to, to crack a nut. OK, so yeah. If you like it, I have stickers with it, so just grab me afterwards. So what we wanted to achieve, what we still want to achieve, and I think at some of our customers we managed to do it, is to create some kind of closed feedback loop. So first, our analysis will come up with some idea, maybe do some explorator Explore, data exploration in, in static warehouses and so on, then we want them to be able to design the process to be run on Flink, test it kind of locally in, in some kind of sandbox testing, then we want them to be able to deploy it in kind of, mm, I would say, staging environments, let it run for like two or three days and see what happens, and afterwards we want them to be kind of courageous enough to click the deploy button and to gather the results from, from production, right? So this is kind of, at that time, we thought it was a bit ambitious goal to, to let the users deploy stuff in production. We are talking about kind of analysts who, who were more uh, used to writing SQL queries. But at some of our clients, we managed to do that. And the main assumptions that we started with were, first, 
all the expressions and well, generally, generally, all this user interface should be accessible for people with kind of semi-technical skills. A little bit of SQL, Excel, but no programming, right? And also, we had to make it very easy for them to be able to test and experiment, so they won't mm, be afraid to click test, to click deploy, and see what happens, right? And the, the last point is that we still assume that some parts of the code will be written in Scala or Java, right? By us developers. The integration, the model, and so on. The things that usually don't change that often, and if they change, then you probably need some, uh, some coding anyway. Because we've seen some of, I would say, graphical tools for designing stuff like that, but once they decide to be totally zero code, they tend to be very, very complex. And we feel that maybe it's better to, to stop somewhere, somewhere in the middle, so that we still need developers from time to time to, re, to write new integrations, new ag aggregates, and so on. But still, we want to let users do most, most of the stuff. So we end up with something more or less uh, like this. So this is kind of the graph uh, of, of one of processing jobs, right? There's a toolbox, and users just drag stuff and can do some filtering, enrichment, aggregations, and so on. Right, so in the toolbox, the users have both kind of common stuff like filtering, defining variables, and so on, but also uh, they have blocks that are unique for their use case, like, for example, get client data from Redis or compute this, uh, this scoring model. And these are developed beforehand. Right, and once the user just drags and drops the stuff, they have to configure the filter, write some expressions, and so on. So after a while, we uh, thought that we'll use something called Spring Expression Language. For those of you who are Java-based, they probably know that it's simple expression language used for configuration files. And we are quite amazed to find out that it can perform very, uh, very well. In fact, we we execute such expressions like, I would say, 200,000 or 300,000 times per second, and it can deal with it. And the language is mm, simple enough to be able to do some kind of basic code completion in the browser so the users can know what they are up to. And if they, they make the mistake, we can correct them even before they save the process. Right? So we do some kind of static analysis of of both the whole graph and, and the expressions. I think it's a it's kind of nice way to, uh, to, to operate with, with your users to let them know that they made some syntactic mistakes. I think with languages with, such as Python, it's kind of more, more problematic, but underneath we use Scala, so we can do quite a lot of stuff, static, nice static typing. Okay, but how all these kind of custom parts will arrive and appear in our toolbox? Well, the idea is, is pretty simple. The idea is that when you kind of uh, deploy, uh, deploy this new snacker at your organization, you prepare a jar file with Java, Scala, or whatever, JVM classes containing your business logic, and then you're, you do it just once, of course, you can update it uh, later. And then the users just write processes, they are safe as JSON files, and together the model, the code, and the JSON will be deployed to, to Flink and live happily there. Right, so the so idea is pretty simple. Of course, under the hood, many, many different things can happen. And in this model, uh, the developers can define the data, be, they can be static like Pojos or class files, or can be, they can be kind of automatically discovered if you use Avro and some kind of things like schema registry. And also some sources of data, sinks of data. There we just kind of more or less mimic uh, Flink APIs. And also some various services for enrichment, doing some actions like blocking accounts and SMSs and so on. And also some custom transformations. We'll talk about it just a little bit later because they involve kind of more advanced uh, Flink concepts. So when we deploy Snacker at 
uh, one of our customers, we have to uh, just implement this kind of uh, this kind of trade, we have to define services, sources, things, some kind of global functions, and so on. And let's look now how to how do we define, for example, a new ways to 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 enrich the data. For example, to to go to Redis and fetch some stuff. Well, we just write normal Scala or Java if you like code. We annotate it with with some kind of parameters, and this is kind of the API of this component that will appear in user's toolbox, right? For developers, it's very easy to, uh, to write, and then the user, the end user, would just have to parameterize it with some kind of expressions. For example, where does the customer ID come from, right? So the idea that it's just kind of function is very powerful because we can, you can use it for many, many, uh, many different things. For example, as I've said, you can get some additional uh, data on the customer from kind of second uh, second storage you can use it to to perform some actions like block client account send sms and so on and so on but you can also use it to uh, to score your data with some models for example if you've been to uh, yesterday to the talk about pfa this is also something that you can do. So you can integrate, for example, models exported from, I don't know, R or, or Spark, and embed it, it into your Java code, and then just uh, use NoSnacker to, 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 to score your models. Right? Of course, these are just kind of simple stateless functions, but what about stuff, more advanced, stateful, uh, fling stuff like Windows, handling state, and other, other fling goodies? So we figured out that we wa don't want to expose the vast uh, uh, Flink APIs to our users because they will be overwhelmed by that, right? The, the amount of different windows that you can configure with Flink is, is very, very large and it's easy to make mistakes. So currently, we just expose some kind of pre-configured windows uh, where the users can define, for example, the length or the key by which the windows are partitioned, and also some, mm, some nitty-gritty details of, of Flink jobs. But the idea is that most of the stuff is configured so they don't mm, feel overwhelmed and they don't do too many mistakes. And we, the developers, we can write just normal Flink code and again annotate it with some kind of parameters and then it will be integrated into the Flink, uh, Flink process that will be deployed uh, when the user decides to, to, to deploy his or her uh, his or her process, right? But nevertheless, we can reach pretty interesting results with that because we can configure not only simple stuff like keys or length of the window, but how do we aggregate stuff? And in the meantime, we've learned, uh, we managed, for example, to teach our analysts to use stuff like, uh, like hyperloglog to compute kind of approximations of uh, unique numbers that client called. Of course, they don't know that's hyperloglog -log because it's called like just unique count approximation. You don't have to understand the nitty gritty details, otherwise you wouldn't be here, right? But they are able to use it and it kind of works. I mean, it works, not only kind of. So, so the stuff that, that William told us yesterday about, it can be used also in, uh, in such uh, graphical user interface. Okay, so now our users can define this nice process. It's colorful, it looks okay, but what now? Of course, we don't want them to deploy it in production immediately. We want them first to be able to test, and then when they are really, eh, really sure that it won't break, then they should deploy it. So we need some testing, and we come up with we came up with two two different kind of flavors of testing. So the first one I wouldn't call it unit testing, but maybe kind of standard box testing. So this is how kind of normal production uh, production pipeline looks like. We take data from Kafka, we 
we process it with Flink, we enrich it with some kind of different data from different data sources, and then we can perform some actions, invoke some services, and put it into or put it into different Kafka topics. But now we don't want to take real data. We want to take data from kind of file with uh, with our prepared test data, and then we want to create some kind of a sandbox Flink mini cluster with within our user interface and take the data from uh, from uh, from the test data file again take real data about the customer so so that the results are kind of more or less like real but then mock out output kafka and mock out external actions but let the users just check what would be invoked so yeah they have this mm, this test data file they test it and then they can see how many events passed through which node what were the results if if everything was filtered out or if we decided that you know, that all the events were, were fraudulent and then they can kind of dig inside and see what were the results of uh, invoking all expressions did they make a mistake or should they just adjust, I don't know, adjust thresholds for detecting fraudsters and so on and so forth. Right? And it wouldn't be so easy for them because sometimes the data is kind of, kind of complex. But fortunately, because most of their data comes from Kafka, we found an easy and nice way to generate this data. That is, we just take, I don't know, 10 or 10, 10 or 100 of latest events from particular Kafka topic, we download it, let the users uh, let the user look a bit a bit on them, and then they can tweak them a little bit. For example, enter their own phone number, and then test do the te sandbox testing using these prepared data. Okay, so this is this is kind of a nice feature that let them uh, test easily in some kind of te sandbox testing. After we are sure that there are no large mistakes, we want them, of course, to deploy stuff to some kind of uh, real environment. And again, thanks to the nature of Flink, Kafka, Redis, and so on, especially with the nature of Kafka, we can do uh, a simple step that allow us uh, to, to do some kind of more like user acceptance or integration testing. That is, we take our production environment and we make a small copy of that in kind of like mm, staging environment. We don't want to run all of the processes there, just the processes that they are worked on at the moment, because it's a smaller environment, but still they should be able to process uh, the whole amount of data for one process. And then we duplicate, uh, duplicate the event stream, right? So our users can deploy the processes they are working on, on the staging environments, when they can see on, on the real data, just duplicate it uh, between our Kafka clusters, and to see, for example, for a day or two, how do they perform before uh, to, to analyze the outcomes before they click the migrate button and deploy stuff uh, to production. And again, we use uh, the exact clone of our uh, customer profile, so we can replicate the production environment as much as, uh, as we can. And then, of course, there comes the big day when they really want, or big afternoon, uh, when they really want to deploy stuff on, on a real production environment and block some clients. And at our largest, largest deployment, they did it quite a few times. We have like more than 50 Flink jobs running both in fraud management and real-time marketing, and the uh, amount of events processed by, by all those uh, processes are more than, I would say, more than 100, 500,000 per second in, dur during some peaks. And they were able to draw quite large diagrams, so it's kind of not so easy to, to see what goes wrong if something goes wrong. So what do we need to have? We need to have, of course, good monitoring, right? We use Grafana for that. Usually, InfluxDB and Grafana is our kind of uh, default monitoring stack. So when somebody creates such a diagram, 
and deploys it, we kind of automatically create some simple Grafana dashboard when they can track some basic statistics like throughput, latencies, uh, amount of errors, and so on. And for many, uh, for many mm, errors, this is kind of enough. Of course, for kind of more detailed analysis, uh, they need to have uh, all those data put to, to, I don't know, some kind of elastic search or, or whatever cluster, m more advanced tools so that they can look at, at the particular events and analyze if they were handled correctly. But for kind of first monitoring, these simple, mm, uh, simple Grafana dashboards are enough. For example, this is, this is a case from the last month at one of our deployments. This is the minute that uh, one of our users deployed uh, a version of a diagram that couldn't handle the load because it tried to, to, to invoke some kind of expensive web service to, to get some data. And he could see more or less immediately, of course he didn't go to the metrics web page, but still, he could see that the performance uh, dropped dramatically. And after he corrected his mistake because he just created some additional filter and so on, so it was kind of simple fix, we can see that performance is okay again, right? So some simple metrics like counts and latencies can, can help really, really a lot uh, to, to detect some kind of bigger errors. Okay, now we still have a little bit of time, so I'll try to show you how it works. I will try to show you. I hope so. Mm. Okay, I can move it. So you can see this is kind of Maybe the resolution is not perfect, but I hope that you can see something. So this is kind of simple, a simple diagram that tries to detect some fraudsters that we take our source of data, that is the calls made at mobile operators. We do some first filtering. We can see uh, there are some fields that we can use, for example, the balance charge or yeah, or MSSDN uh, that was calling, that's the phone number that was calling, uh, the phone number that was called, and so on and so on. We can do some basic aggregations. For example, here we want to detect how many unique numbers the customer called in last four hours. And if this number is large enough, okay, larger than two probably, this is not good in real use case. We can take his customer profile, see if it's a post bay or postpaid or prepaid account, and then maybe even prepare some kind of, in my case, this is very simple uh, model uh, uh, exported to, to, to this PFA format and score it to, to see if we need to either send just him an alert that he calls too much, or if we are sure he's a fraudster, just blocks his account, right? So this diagram is pretty simple, but nevertheless, it can save our customers quite a lot of money. So now we're probably not really sure that it's working yet. So let's generate some test data, like 20 samples. Okay, we have, uh, we have a file with, with the data that came from the Kafka. We won't be looking at them too large. And then we drag, drop. And now Flink Mini Cluster is spawned in some inside our environment, and we can see how many of the samples uh, just went through, through our filters, right? So this is the filter that filters out the largest amount because this, this, this is the filter of, of uh, how many uni unique numbers were called. And now we can see here, okay, this is JSON, so this is again something that your customers have to get used to what were the outcomes of, of which expressions and filters, right? And if we are sure, we can push the deploy button. I have did it some time ago and see the metrics. I have some random data generator that works pretty well. And we can see so how many events per second we are processing, on which, uh, which nodes the events were ejected, how many nodes uh, received uh, th this final nodes, how many of them received how many events, and some basic latencies, for example, how much time uh, will pass from, from the 
from the call to the moment when we process the data, right? And after a while, for example, if we, uh, we, if we left the, uh, our process for a day or two, we can check how many, for example, events passed through uh, each of the nodes in, I don't know, in last hour. I had some problems with time zones, so we'll see today. And we can see that through our process, oh, like 160,000 events passed, but only, mm, only 100, 50, 100 passed through, through, through all those filters and so on. So we can hide it. And this is kind of more or less how our clients uh, are used to work nowadays. Probably they also want to migrate stuff to production and so on. But I think you should uh, get the idea of how is this working. We don't have much more time, but it's good because I don't have much more to say. I want you to remember this, this idea that we, want to, uh, that we want to close the feedback loop and let our users with minimal help from developers come from the idea to process design, testing in sandbox, testing in kind of integration environment, and then deployment to production and monitoring. This is very important that there's minimal aid from, from developers who are, like me, usually, well, expensive, lazy, and they are kind of not, not always ready to help when, when business needs it. But on the other hand, probably, even if you can manage to, to, to achieve 80% of your staff with UI, you still have to remember that you have to have competent, expensive developers to do the last 20% of that with the code. Because you cannot just go with zero code systems, some code needs to be written, right? And I think solutions such as ours can be used mainly in kind of on the middle ground between, uh, between cases when you want to do some kind of ad hoc analysis that have exploration and visualization, and between places when you have to be real sure that your processes are working correctly, when you probably want to have uh, real kind of coding practices like reviews, continuous integration, deployment. And on the middle ground, you have processes just like marketing stuff or fraud detection that you need production-ready stuff, good production SLAs. But on the other hand, if your user makes a mistake, probably it won't have kind of dramatic consequences. Of, how, of course, you, can, you have to do some stuff to make sure that it, it's more or less safe. But still, most of the processes, you, they can just be designed for kind of by analysts or business people. And if you want to learn something more about uh, how we do it and and whereas it is on the GitHub and this RFID code should point you to some kind of case studies. I don't have much experience with RFID code, so I don't know if it works, but hopefully it does. We still have, I think, almost two minutes for questions. So thank you very much for coming and listening to me and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs> mm. How long did it take to build this, and um, was this a customer initiative or your initiative? Uh, well, 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 it, it kind of, was jo I would say, joint in initiative. I mean, we came up with the idea to build it, and the customer accepted the idea that we will build it and open source it, and we kind of, mm, we cover part of the cost, they cover part of the cost. But, you know, it was surprisingly easy, easy to build because Flink is really great and a great framework. And in Scala, it was quite easy to, to do it. And also, there are, you know, mature uh, front-end frameworks that let you do this, kind of, this kind of user interfaces. So for the same question, time-wise, team size, what did it take? Well, uh, most of the stuff that I've shown you, it was like, I don't know, less than a year uh, by a team of two or three people. So I think it was kind of worth it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I'll be around if you, if you have any more questions. <laughs>